Web components sit in this uncanny valley. They're not quite React components, but not quite with the grain of the web either. But that's only because we've been thinking about and using them wrong. Today, I'm going to show you a better way to use web components, or at least one that works with the grain of the web rather than against it. Hi, I'm Chris Ferdinandi. That's my face. You can find me online at gomakethings.com. I teach people a simpler, more resilient way to make things for the web through courses, workshops, and my daily developer tips newsletter. I also consult with some amazing clients. These days, that often means building custom web components like I did recently for a project with NASA. Web components have been around for a long time. They were first introduced way back in 2011, and they've been supported in all major browsers for years. When they first came out, a lot of people thought they were going to be the thing that finally killed React. They weren't. People often use them like you would use a React component though. Many tutorials start with an empty custom HTML element, and then they use JavaScript to inject the HTML. Oh, and don't forget about the Shadow DOM. There was so much hype around using the Shadow DOM when web components first came out. It was kind of a major selling feature of web components. And you use it to keep your HTML isolated from the rest of the UI. Of course, once you do that, your HTML no longer has access to your global style sheets. So you need to start injecting your CSS with JavaScript too. This approach feels a lot like React, except native. But if you want React-like components, React and smaller libraries like Preact actually do that better. For example, web components do not have any sort of built-in data reactivity, although you can hack that in with proxies. But more importantly, they don't have DOM diffing and they don't have support for single file components. For developers who like React, web components just aren't Reacty enough. But because this approach often starts with an empty element that relies on JavaScript to render its content, web standards and progressive enhancement evangelists like me dislike them too. I think this is why it feels like it's taken so long for web components to really catch on. So for the rest of this talk, I wanna show you a better way. It's the approach that I used with NASA and various other clients to build web components that are simple, reliable, and that work with the grain of the web. Here's the agenda for the rest of this talk. We are going to start by looking at a new approach to working with web components. Then we're gonna explore some tips and tricks that make working with them a little bit easier. And we're gonna round things out by looking at some specific examples, including actually building a web component from scratch. But let's start by talking about a new way of thinking about web components that's actually kind of old school. In November of 2023, Jeremy Keith wrote an article on a different approach for building web components. And he wrote, try not to bring React mindset with you. Do you really need to invent an entirely new component from scratch? Or can you use HTML up until it reaches its limit and then enhance the markup? And he called this approach HTML web components. An HTML web component is all about progressive enhancement. Rather than an empty element, you actually start with perfectly functional HTML. For example, here we have a collection of headings and some associated content. Now let's imagine we eventually want this to be an accordion component where the content is hidden by default and clicking on one of those headings shows or hides the content that goes with it. We could use a web component for that as a very convenient way to enhance what's there into something more powerful and interactive. We would start by wrapping our content in the accordion group custom element. And then when the web component runs and does its thing, the HTML in the DOM ends up looking more like this. There's now button elements around all of the heading text, appropriate ARIA attributes, and the content is hidden. But if this never actually ran, you would still have some perfectly usable markup already there, ready to use. Now this probably feels a lot like old school DOM manipulation. And honestly, that's because it is. But web components bring a lot of huge benefits that make building interactive UI a lot easier. For example, web components are much easier to write. You get to write your HTML as HTML rather than HTML in JavaScript. And rather than having to create unique selectors that you pass into a constructor method, 
you define your web component once, and then you wrap your HTML in your custom element. You can even have multiple versions of it on a page. Each one is going to automatically instantiate as its own unique instance. Because functional base HTML is already there, the user gets a usable experience immediately. And if your web component fails to load for some reason, users still have a perfectly functional experience instead of one that doesn't work. Web components let you provide options and settings declaratively in the markup. This means that uh, it's a lot more obvious what's happening just by looking at the HTML. Behavior isn't hidden away in a JavaScript file somewhere. And you can include multiple instances, each with their own settings, just through HTML alone. You no longer have to instantiate multiple instances with different selectors and settings, often some JavaScript file that you have to go locate every time you want to make an update. Let's look at some tips and tricks that make working with web components even easier, particularly when you use the HTML web component approach. If you've never created a web component before, let's start with our custom element. Here, I'm going to use the most cliche of examples, a counter component. Now, this is actually a terrible example for an HTML web component because it's useless without the JavaScript. That button does nothing, um, so we're not really enhancing any existing markup. It can't do anything without the JavaScript. But it's a really simple example to follow along with. So if you've never worked with web components before, it's a great teaching tool. So we're just going to roll with it. In our JavaScript file, we are going to use the custom elements define method to define our custom element and associate some behavior with it. And you do that by passing in the name of the custom element as a string. Here we've got count up. And then a class that extends the HTML element class. And in that class, you include a constructor method that runs automatically on each element and creates a unique instance of your web component. Inside the constructor, you always run the super method first. This gives you access to the properties and methods of that HTML element class that our web component class is extending. And then after that, you can run any of your custom code. So let's look at some of the things we might do there. Web components have encapsulation built right into them, even if you don't use the shadow DOM. So they won't be isolated from the main HTML, but they will still be scoped to your component. And that's really, really handy. Uh, inside the constructor, the this keyword refers to the current custom element and the web component instance that goes with it. So you can define properties on it and search for elements within it using the this keyword. Here, I'm defining a count property, and that's going to be unique to each custom count up element. So if we had more than one, each one gets its own unique count property. And I'm also going to assign a button property, uh, and I want to find the button that needs to get clicked. To do that, I can use the query selector method on this, on the custom element itself. So I don't have to use some more complicated method for finding the correct button that goes with each instance. You also get built-in CSS scoping if you want it. By using the light DOM instead of the shadow DOM, your web component is going to automatically inherit your global style sheet styles. But you can scope your styles to the web component by using that custom HTML element as part of the selector string. So for example, if we wanted the button in our count up element to have some slightly different styles than the typical button, we can style it by including count up as part of that button selector. You can even use CSS to detect when the JavaScript is ready with the defined pseudo class. And you can combine it with the not pseudo class to detect when JavaScript is not ready yet. So uh, for example, since the button isn't really usable or functional until our JavaScript loads, we might use display none to hide it under count up not defined and then once our web component is defined and ready, that style automatically clicks off and the button becomes visible. Web components have some built-in methods that make event handling even easier too. With the add event listener method, you can pass in an object instead of a callback function as the second argument. If the object has a handle event method, that method automatically runs in response to the event and receives the event object as an argument. Now, why would you do this instead of a callback function? Well, 
In a normal callback function, the this keyword doesn't refer to the instance. It might refer to the element or to the window object, depending on the context in which it's used. But in the handle event method, this is the instance, which means that we can access instance properties and methods without having to use the bind method or some other complicated approach. It makes it much easier for us to work with all of the features of our web component. Here, I am increasing the count by one and then updating the text in our button whenever that click event fires. If you need to listen to more than one event type, you can also create on methods in your class for each of the different event types and then use the handle event method to automatically route events to them. It's really, really handy if you have a more complex component with a lot of different things going on. With web components, you use custom attributes in your HTML to define options and settings. For example, let's say you wanted users to be able to define a custom starting number for the counter. You could add an optional start attribute to your count up element. Here, we want this one to start at 42. In your constructor, you can use the element get attribute method to get the start attribute on your custom element. Remember, this is scoped with the this keyword, which is great. Uh, and then you can use the parse float method to convert it from a string into a number. If that attribute exists and it's a valid number, you can use it for the this count property. If not, you fall back to zero as your default. What makes this approach particularly nice is that you can have multiple instances of your web component on a page, each with their own options and settings without having to write any additional JavaScript. It's all handled through the HTML. And you can tell just from looking at the element what its specific settings are and how you might expect it to behave. While web components don't have reactive data like React or Vue does, they do have a built-in mechanism for detecting attribute changes. For example, let's say that you wanted to stop the count up component from counting when the pause attribute is added. First, you define an array of attributes that you want to observe and assign them to the static observed attributes property. And you do this for performance reasons because you don't want to be watching every single attribute that may possibly get added to an element. Uh, it's just going to slow things down a lot. So you just, you say, these are the ones to pay attention to. The attribute changed callback method runs automatically whenever one of your observed attributes is added, removed, or changes in value. And uh, it also automatically receives three arguments. The name of the attribute that was added, removed, or changed, its old value, and its new value. In this particular instance, I am removing the click event listener from our button when the pause attribute is added. Now, there may be situations where you want to detect if the attribute has been added or removed. And you can do that by checking the value of the old val and new val properties. Old val has a value of null when the attribute was just added. There was no old value, it's this first time there. And the new val, val uh, attribute, uh, property rather, has a value of null when it's been removed because there's no longer a value associated with that attribute. So in this particular instance, if new val equals null, so if the attribute has been removed, I'm going to add my click event uh, listener back onto my button. Otherwise, I'm going to remove it. Now let's look at some examples of things that HTML web components are particularly great at. Let's say you have a button and you want to show or hide some content when it's pressed. So just a classic disclosure, show hide kind of component. You might start by wrapping a custom element around it. In this case, we're gonna call it show hide. And now you have an easy way to associate a button with a piece of content. If there's no JavaScript, no worries, users can still see the content. Let's look at how we might actually build out the interactivity around this though. We'll start by defining our custom element. Uh, using the custom elements define method, we pass in show hide as the element name and our class that extends the HTML element class. And then in the constructor, we're going to run the super method and define our properties. We'll get the button from inside our component and then we'll get the content that goes along with that by grabbing the next element sibling of that button. 
Next, we want to set up the initial UI. We need to add an ARIA expanded attribute to the button with a value of false. And this is an accessibility requirement. Uh, the ARIA expanded attribute communicates to screen reader users whether the content that goes with that button is visible or hidden. And then we'll hide the content using the hidden attribute. Now the HTML in the UI looks a bit like this. Next, we'll add a click event listener to our button. We'll pass in the instance instead of a callback function so that we can use the built-in handle event method. Now under ARIA authoring practices for a show hide pattern, the button should have an ARIA expanded value of true when the content is visible and false when it's hidden. So inside our handle event method, we can check the value of the attribute on our button and then show or hide the content accordingly. Now you could also set a property for this, but I like associating it with the ARIA attribute. I think it's a convenient way to handle state in this particular case. We will update the ARIA expanded attribute and add or remove the hidden attribute on the content depending on whether the content is currently shown or currently hidden. So we'll just, we'll flip it around and do the opposite. And now that we have a functional component, we can add some styling to make it look a little bit nicer. We might, for example, change the button color based on whether the content is hidden or visible. And we can hook into the ARIA expanded attribute for that too. Here, um, I have a default button color for my show hide component of blue. And when the content is expanded, I'm darkening that up to a darker blue. And I'm also scoping this in my CSS to just the show hide element, because I don't want these styles to affect, affect other elements. And maybe we want to hide the button element until our web component JS loads, since the button is effectively useless without JavaScript anyways. We can use the not and defined pseudo classes for that. Super convenient. Another example, we looked at this earlier, but web components are a great, great way to transform a collection of headings and content into an accordion group. No JavaScript, no worries. Users still have access to all of the headings and all of the content that goes with it. Um, I'm not gonna walk through the code for the rest of these examples because we'd be here all day. Uh, you might also take a list of anchor links and their associated content and turn them into toggle tabs. No JavaScript, users still get perfectly functional collections of links and content. And they can just click a link to jump down to that content. One of my favorite uses though is forms. I like to take forms that work, or create rather forms that work with old school server submits and full page reloads by default. That way if there's no JavaScript, users can still interact with that form just the way they would if there was JavaScript. But then I use web components to turn them into Ajaxy forms that send data to the server asynchronously using a fetch request. And then I show a status message or update the UI without reloading the entire page. Without JS, you still get a perfectly usable form, but with it, you get something even better. If you forget everything else about this talk, I hope you remember this one key takeaway. Start with HTML and enhance it with web components. If you enjoyed this talk and want to learn more, head over to gomakethings.com where you can find a bunch of resources including articles, examples, boilerplates, and more.